We're live. Hi, it's Matt Fittis with Agility Technologies. I want to welcome all of our attendees. I'm sure there's going to be some coming into the live webinar a little late, but uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, we have uh, two presenters today um, talking about 360 spherical imaging. Uh, one of them is Alan Jacobson. Uh, Alan Jacobson is the North American Sales Manager for Agility T Technologies. Uh, myself, Matt Fittis, I am the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer for Agility Technologies and manage all the international sales and marketing for the company. And of course, we have Joe Hernandez, who um, is our guest speaker. Uh, Joe is the CEO of Disaster Medical Solutions. Um, he's also a FEMA medical specialist instructor and has been a part of FEMA for many years. Um, he'll be the second presenter in the live webinar today. Um, I'm going to sign off here, but before I do, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do have Q&A um, questions and answers. Uh, if anyone has a question, uh, please use the question icon at the very, I think the top right of your window. Um, we'll do Q and A at the very end of the live webinar, um, and then uh, your questions will be published uh, when I publish them. I have a little bit of the power to do that, um, but we'll discuss uh, all the questions and, and and have answers to those questions at the at the uh, the end of the presentations. All right. Um, other than that, let's get going. Um, it is eight oh two. I'd like to welcome everyone from obviously the west coast of North America. Uh, the East Coast of North America, the people in the middle of North America. Uh, we have uh, registered um, attendees from South America. Uh, welcome. We have registered attendees from Asia uh, as well as Europe. So welcome to everyone. Uh, really appreciate uh, you coming on today. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, give this up to Alan. And Alan um, is going to uh, start you off today. Give me a second here, and I'm going to send Alan live right now. Alan, go for it. Alan, your microphone. Alan, your microphone. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. There so as go. I mentioned, now this is our first webinar. <laughs> <laughs> so I forgot to unmute my microphone. Please bear with us. We're pretty excited about this, I'm not nervous at all. I love talking about this product. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is just sort of because we have a lot of new people joining us for the first time, I want to make sure that they understand how the camera actually functions, how it's different from traditional cameras that were designed upwards of 20 years ago. So that when we talk later about applications, about uses, you have an idea of why we're so excited about this non articulating camera head. So that's what I'm going to start with and then we'll get to the to the meat of the subject which is uh, uh, Joe Hernandez and all of his vast experience in the field which I think is what most of you have tuned in for. So I'm going to start communicating about the FL360. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail so I do want you to know that uh, Matt and I are available for one-on-one -on -one sessions about the actual camera itself that we can do using this video suite that we've created here. So if I don't cover everything you want to know about the camera in technical terms, by all means, reach out to us and we can set up a separate um, uh, meeting with you. So the biggest thing about this camera is how robust it is, how absolutely light it is, and the fact that it's this is the camera. So it's a wireless product. It uses two cameras, one on either side, that we stitch together in a tablet uh, wirelessly through software that's available on Google Play Store at no charge. So basically these two cameras, there's no moving pieces in this camera head. So that's an extreme bonus for longevity of the camera and it gives us some extremely good opportunities to change the dynamics of using cameras in a rescue scenario. All right, so essentially we also have lighting on here, which I'll show you uh, briefly. But because this camera is, this is the only thing, we have lots of choices about how we want to use it. We can use it with a eye hook that's included with our, our hooks, our kits, that allows you to drop this camera vertically. 
right? You can also put it on extendable poles, uh, which we provide in our kits, or even a little adapter that we sell that allows you to use a paint pole adapter that you can get at your local hardware store that can go up to 20 feet. So you can essentially turn this little camera into a super probe. So very simple little devices like that, uh, really accessorized. It's powered by two lithium ion batteries that give the battery, the camera a four hour life in normal circumstances. So that's a lot of, lot of juice packed into a small package and they're very fast to recharge. Because we allow the camera to go submersible for 10 feet for 30 minutes, we do include an environmental lid that will go on the camera right here and that protects the camera seal. Always ensure that the little ribbon isn't sticking out because that will then you know allow water in and the camera can get damaged but that little environmental lid allows us to go underwater 10 feet three meters for 30 minutes i'm going to put on the lid that has our speaker and microphone simple it's a four millimeter it is included in the kit if you run over with your truck it's easy to buy at the local hardware store nothing really proprietary unique about a lot of the accessories and tools that we include with this. So there we go, my camera. I'm going to install it on my Pro, which comes with the USAR kit, and it also has the RAM mount. So you can treat this camera just like you would any of the other um, uh, cameras that came before, where it's uh, one camera on a pole with your video display attached. But always knowing that it is wireless, we don't have to use it this way, but we do give you that opportunity. One trick that you have to know about using this camera is that this FL360 logo is always to the right and it's always parallel to the ground because, and I, for all you search guys out there, no more rotating the camera. You do not rotate the camera. It stays in this fixed position, whether you're going vertical, or you're going horizontal, this FL360 is parallel to the ground, and it's uh, all of the rotation is done on the tablet, which I will show you. So in the moment, what I'm gonna do is actually turn on the lights here a little bit, and I'm gonna insert this camera right now into my search box. Actually, let me just let, allow you to see that happening. All right, so now we see as we go around, I'm gonna adjust my camera so it's sitting to the front. You can see our wonderful boardroom here at Agility in uh, Richmond, BC, Canada. I'm going to put the camera into the hole. Got to rotate it here to its, its correct position. And then I'm going to actually go down. All right. So now I'm in my search box. And what this allows me to do is now I control the camera the image of the camera, because remember there's no moving pieces on the camera head with my finger, right? So now the circle is always the front, the X is always the back. I can pinch and zoom a little bit, but this is the first camera on the marketplace that allows you to see the entry point into the space. And that's important because it's always been one of those problems where, yes, you breach a hole, you put the hole through, and then uh, what do you can see the back wall? There could be a person laying against it. In this, there's power. There's right there by the hole that we made. So we just missed the power. That brings up the question, have we turned off power to this building? Uh, do we want to avoid that? If we breach this space, may we go to the right as opposed to the left, All right? At any point in time, I can hit this top little corner here. I can open it up and this will always center the camera. Uh, we've got lots of other opportunities in here. Again, you can see we've uh, got a little macabre here. We've got a, a finger missing from a, <laughs> a hand down here. Um, we've got a couple of different shelves. It's a great little tool to have a little search box to be able to uh, demonstrate and to train with the camera. We have the ability to record a two second video. And I'll show you that in a moment. We have the ability to take pictures. Um, if I go back here, I go to my gallery, I go to my video. It's a two, three second video, but that three second video captures the entire space. 
So that gives us just massive opportunities to actually inspect multiple uh, multiple um, holes, confined spaces, void spaces, and then review them under out of the sun, out of the rain, out of the snow, and then you can determine which ones to go back to. So there's a lot going on with this camera. Uh, images, same thing, I just take a picture. And at this particular point, both in video and picture, I have the ability to share that. We're using Samsung uh, tablets. And it allows us to email, oops, it allows us to email, send a drive. Uh, you can put Outlook on here, you can put OneDrive on here, all of these things. And you can even put a SIM card inside the tablet and do all of this without disconnecting from the camera and going into the live feed. <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna just get out of this here for a moment. Go home, go back to my camera. All right, so now I've got to turn my lights back on. And there we go. It's as simple as that. I mean, so easy to use, but the unique thing is you don't no more rotating of the camera head. Now, because we have these two little cameras on there, um, when we talk about um, searching, we just have to get one of those cameras into the space. And then because if we're a little tight confined, uh, one of those cameras will give us a view inside the space. So it's really quite powerful. That articulating camera head of our of older designs, they needed so much room inside the void space to move back and forth to see anything because they're pointing directly at. So this opens us up to truly the first camera that, yes, was built for search, but it can do so much more now. It, it, and in other disciplines of... Um, confined space, uh, which mind you, it's not intrinsically safe approved, so you have to be careful, it's ventilated, but you also can do into vehicle accidents, industrial accidents, uh, trench, uh, high angle. Imagine attaching to this to the top of the guy who's rappelling down. You can view everything that's going on, including what's going on above, and what's going on horizontally on the floors as they're passing through. So quite remarkable. I can go on on this for hours, but I'm not because I'm not the main attraction here. <laughs> it is uh, it is Joe. Um, before I leave here, though, I do want to um, let people know that we do have this kitted up in a in a variety of ways. Probably our our most popular is our USAR One kit. This comes with a 10 inch tablet, which also allows us to use hardwire. So we have a 10 foot hardwire cable that it comes with the kit, and then we have the ability to sell optionally a hundred foot. Uh, cable that allows you to connect to the camera wired in case you're having any issues with wireless or you're going into some structure that doesn't support wireless and they are out there lead line buildings solid rock buildings pentagon for instance something like that and then we have um, our basically our <clears throat> rsk which is a rapid search kit also designed around search so this is a, a chest pack. You have the smaller tablet on there, same camera, smaller poles, accessorized differently for that, that team that has they get to the scene first and they're looking for the low hanging fruit, right? And then uh, the newest one, which is uh, a direct result of conversations with our guests today is the uh, MRK, the Medic Rescue Kit. So we feel, and Joe's gonna go into more detail about this, we feel that this is the kit. It's on a Moab uh, 10 pack, that sling pack that goes over your back. It's lightweight, it's small, it's cost effective. And this is the for the team that follows up uh, the rescue team, uh, the search team. So the search team identifies a victim. They get that victim um, uh, noted. They make all the markings. They uh, call the rescue team. This is now the victim assessment and extraction team device kit. So that's, Joe's gonna go into that, so I'm not gonna steal his, uh, his thunder on that. Um, again, if you have any questions about the technical side of this camera, this is sort of where we end on that, on the demonstration of how it works, but we'd be happy to talk to you about that. If Joe wants me to demonstrate something during his presentation, I'll be happy to do so. And this, this, video is going to be broadcast on YouTube so you can uh, refrain you can look back at it later and if you actually have to leave the session before it's over don't worry you'll have access to it to watch it again so uh, 
having said that, I want to uh, I want Joe to introduce himself because he's got a long list of all of these things that he's involved in. Uh, I remember last year at Sousa, I tried to get 10 minutes with the man, and it was like there's a lineup of people around him, like, all the time. And uh, so anyway, Joe, I'm going to send it over to you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for participating in our very first webinar. Appreciate it. You're live, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Alan, thank you. I don't think that uh, Jilly could have picked a better, more responsible person, and I think the country here in the US, U.S. will benefit greatly from your support uh, that you're going to be giving everyone out there. So thank you very much. And Matt, thank you for the opportunity of coming on. Um, I'm excited uh, just being a part and seeing what agility has developed. Um, first, Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome from South Florida. Saludos a ustedes que hablan español. Entiendo que hay algunos de ustedes de España. Unos rescate de buscada como nosotros. And everyone else that's out there, that's the only other language. A little bit of patois from Haiti when we had that experience. But I'm presently retired, and you get to see that uh, I grew a little facial hair. And 2020 uh, allowed me to even grow more facial hair since some face-to-face -face training in the U.S. here was compromised. Um, I've had the pleasure of serving over 30 years in emergency, re emergency response, um, serving from firefighter, paramedic, uh, rescue diver, TRT team member, uh, driver engineer, company officer, and I had the privilege of being selected in the early 90s, shortly after the earthquakes in Palo Alto, California, which is really what launched FEMA back in uh, the beginning of 90s. and. Uh, we were selected to help start and form uh, Florida Task Force 2, which is one of the 28 federal FEMA teams coming out of the city of Miami, and uh, had the privilege of serving as a medical specialist and medical team coordinator uh, till shortly uh, before my retirement. So it was uh, a great ride, fun ride, and now I get to um, have the privilege of uh, instructing, teaching uh, with Disaster Medical Solutions. We've been able to provide instructions and using the Agility 360 camera uh, not just in the U.S., but many members in the INSURAG uh, Association, which I understand are probably listening as we are here speaking, so many of those teams across the nation. And uh, I guess some of the experiences that they wanted to appear that I've, we've been associated with, either from the fire department and also from the USAR task force, of course, include uh, Hurricane Andrew, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, Puerto Rico building explosion, uh, the value jet crash in the Everglades, uh, the, the World Trade Center attacks, Hurricane Katrina, several other, many other hurricanes, and of course the Haiti earthquake retiring shortly after. And uh, Matt, I guess you wanted to bring up some things uh, regarding uh, medical response in USAR events. And I know that this is the focal point, and USAR is the focal point, and why search cameras were really invented and taken us to that, but as Alan mentioned, it's grown. Um, and agility has really taken that to a new level that it's not just the urban search and rescue, big disaster, but any special operations uh, event that requires personnel for possible people trapped, an entrapment, an engulfment, a structural collapse, a bridge collapse, a, a pet stuck inside a sewage. As Alan mentioned earlier, just the suspension from a high line coming down during a repelling or during a save entry. Uh, we deal with suspension injuries and crush injuries around the extremities just from that. So you can imagine what you'd be able to capture with that camera being able to give you that personal view of what's going on with that patient. And so I'd like to really thankful, uh, we're real thankful that uh, Agility stepped out of the box and uh, listened to a lot of the providers, took that information and bam, created the MRK1. Um, uh, I think it's uh, on the medical side, it's uh, it's our slice of piece of bread. Uh, we know that the big cameras are out there. We know the importance of them. And we always see that when the cameras are brought out, used for very technical purposes, the tech search personnel are there, the engineers are there, the commanders are there. And we very, very, very rarely get medical personnel involved. No one ever calls the medic over there and says, hey, what do you see and what do you think? And it's pretty astonishing because once there is either verbal or visual contact with a victim, guess what? 
He's mine now. It's a medical patient. I can now begin assessment. I can begin treatment. And then we can talk about extrication a little bit later at a, at a longer time. But I believe that the camera, especially a smaller camera that is able to be immediately deployed upon a special event, a special operations event, uh, has extremely changed the way that we can bring medicine to those entrapped victims with limited access. Um, search cameras are operate, mostly operated, we said, by those personnel. And we believe that before any movement of those patients are done, uh, before they realize as they're looking through the camera that extrication is perfect and timing and let's get them out of there and let's get them to the hospital, um, we saved a person. Treatment is very important. We know that if a person is entrapped and suffers from what we know is crush syndrome, uh, from heavy material or a heavy weight lying upon them or just themselves lying upon their own heavy tissues and not being able to roll over will create crush in itself, i.e. somebody on a backboard that is immobilized and can't move for 12 hours. Those buttocks and those shoulders and back uh, will tend to have issues. And so we know that we decrease survivability by moving those patients. So putting the camera in, finding a way to extricate, quickly moving that patient, getting them to medical care is not the way we treat in this century. Should not be. We don't do it in the austere environment of the military. And so we should definitely not do it with all the resources that we have here in this country. We should be able to provide treatment and that includes treatment for those certain issues, i.e. as we mentioned with crush. In our area, we call it, it's more of a stay and play instead of a load and go. We don't talk about the golden hour, we're really talking about the golden day. Because by the time that the cameras, hopefully, and what we're trying to push and what we're trying to be hopeful for, especially in the community, and now as a retiree being one that's gonna be rescued, is this camera really belongs on every commander, uh, fire battalion, EMS commander, um, small EMS departments with non-fire, small fire departments. Um, the availability, the price structure, and the ability to be able to save a life with this is second to none. I'd really like to show you some of the uh, presentations that we put together. It gives you an idea exactly what it might look like underneath there. Um, we know that I'm providing no. care to that person and providing care to those individuals that are down there is as important as extrication. The extrication may take a little time. It may take 10 minutes, it may take 10 hours. And in that time, is there anything that we can do for that patient during that time? So I'll just put you really quick through a little uh, presentation on a PowerPoint and uh, give you an idea of what's going on. But uh, you'll be able to see We're gonna that- go uh, Live right there, you go. You're live, you're ready, oh. you're ready to go into presentation. You got it. Welcome to the limited patient assessment and this is the gist of this camera for us on the medical side. We believe that we can actually do a limited patient assessment. Uh, the patient seems to be at a distance of at least 12 feet. Uh, we're going to try and provide an evaluation, but could you imagine if I can see 360 degrees after providing entry from the camera, looking all the way down to her feet, looking all the way to her head, looking on the other side of her, can I now provide a better medical assessment by having better equipment? And if the answer is yes, then that's a no brainer for those of you that are out there and able to purchase this for your department, for your members, and mostly for your community. So the challenge is that we have, we gotta modify how we're gonna evaluate this person. We gotta form a treatment plan. You can see that this person isn't really responsive at this point in time, face is down. At one point though, that water bottle that you see to their left was not there. That water bottle was provided to that patient. That water bottle was provided to the patient through the same hole that was bore for the camera head to be inserted to find those victims. During the Haiti earthquake, we did find and learn that some of the water bottles, because of some of the holes that were bore, were too large. The water bottles just didn't make it without being squeezed. And so one of the things that solid responder did was create a survivor pod, a small two inch, 12, two inch wide, 12 inches long pod that you could provide items for these patients. And I'll give you an idea on some of those items in a minute. You can see as a search cam, it's very valuable tool. Uh, the gentlemen are able to look at it in the picture. 
Uh, they're trying to establish location. They're trying to establish how many patients there are. They're trying to see if they can go through a primary and a secondary survey and even do an advanced care. It's now time to bring in a medic and see what else we can accomplish from there. And so as a medic in speaking to these patients, being able to provide a voice along with the visual contact, we're able to ask her to lift her head. She follows command or ask her for a focal. She's able to look at us. So I've accomplished a level of consciousness. I know my patient's breathing. I sure know their blood pressure is pretty stable in that she was able to not only drink the water, the water bottle had moved, and she, but she was also able to lift her head. On the far right hand side, you can see what an extricated, possibly almost a self extricated victim would have looked like. And to give you an idea what those victims look like, and not that a medic is going to find anything that a tech search specialist who spends time practicing with this camera, but it is a great idea if you do have a camera to spend some time searching practicing with it, but you can see on the left hand picture, the small eyes, the crown of the nose and the forehead of victim. On the middle picture, they move the camera to the right and you could see a second victim. You could see the mouth, you could see the cheeks. And in the third picture to the right, they were able to expand the size and capture both victims. And so as Alan was moving the camera and showing during the preview of how the 360, you could imagine the better view, um, the expanded view, better said, that we would be able to get with these pictures if we had the ability of using a 360 camera. Unfortunately, in 2010, uh, during the Her Haiti earthquake, um, Agility had not uh, yet invented the 360 camera, so we were limited to straight focal shots of what we could see. And um, this would give you an idea on a verbal so we've gone from visual to now verbal and communicating with those patients. A little hand movement. Fixing a face mask. And holding a face mask to her face. And so Listening to the person within the whole puts us back to a real quick little intervention in those water bottles. We try to provide patient care, patient PPE. I like to send it down with a light stick because if you've been in darkness for over a period of time, whether it's day or night inside a confined space, most of the time is pretty dark. So having a light stick illuminating the area, illuminating that for the patient sometimes is a breath of fresh air and definitely a psychological intervention. Inside those bottles, we also put in dust mask, uh, eye shield or eye protection. Uh, we put in a moist towelette, some type of uh, saline that they can rinse their face off. You could see the picture on the left, the gentleman, his face is not the same color as his hands. He was able to use some of the water and get the dust off of his face, which is pretty important for us regarding dust impaction and how long he's been inhaling the dust. He was able to put his own mask on and he had a hard time getting to the child who was next to him you could see how he is positioned he only has his left hand to work with his right arm is impinged from the shoulder and he's trying to be able to help the young lady on the left who was finally rescued you could see her on the right um, usually about seven hours later uh, trying to protect her one of the things we forgot to put down there and you heard it during the video that i just saw that you just saw was her screaming she screamed because we forgot to put earplugs inside there Something so simple that we could have put inside that water bottle along with the face mask and the eye pros was a set of earplugs that might have not let her hear the starting of the saws for extrication and it would have prevented some of the psychological events that we caused her to go through. A couple other pictures uh, for you to see how patient care can grow as the area becomes more breached, uh, usually through the use of search cameras because they're able to see extra areas of entry and also extra areas of extrication. Um, they finally made it to these patients where they can start IV lines. We can begin treatment for crush and or any other issues that these victims may have. Um, picture on the left hand side, you can see that in 2010, uh, they used a search cam. We talk about having equipment with limited access and what's important. And we feel that search cams are very important. They were used by these several teams, not only by Florida's teams, but also by 
New York and by LA County and Virginia one search cams were very, very used on the right hand side the picture of one that was rescued with an amputation uh, that was performed during that time. Um, and since we talk about the amputation on that, let's understand the importance of possibility of having to come and having to be presented with a situation like that. Is that limb intact? Um, are we able to see the other side of that limb? Is the limb crushed? Is the limb totally intact? Alan mentioned the fact of being able to use the camera during automobile accidents. I know that if I took a, a Kelly tool and punched a hole in a fuselage, it was able to introduce the camera into the car, the vehicle, the bus, the train, um, the printing press, whatever it was, if I was able to gain access entry into that area and see what's on the other side of the victim. What's what, what can't we see? Um, at times that, limb may be mangled and at that time life over limb unstabilized patient it is time to amputate and then do a field amputation to remove the patient um, but at times that limb may be in great shape that commander sees the limb and turns around to his crew and says i don't care what you need to do you're not doing an amputation she has a great looking leg on the other side so we're going to do everything possible to extricate this person completely intact and so you see the other scenarios that are there for that Alan did mention the mine industry since the camera is not intrinsically there. But in decision making, but we're, we're always thinking the type of entrapment, uh, how long they've been in there, how long it's going to take them to get out. Do we have any treatable injuries? How many patients are there? The kind of patients, the amount of resources and capabilities it's going to take. Hazardous materials. Alan mentioned the possibility of seeing or not being able to see electrical lines when he was showing the camera. With the 360, you were able to capture those electrical lines, but unfortunately with a camera that only shows in one direction, you may not see those hazardous materials and or hazardous incidences that are there. And then again, how long it's going to take us to reach them. So the equipment is definitely a preparation, uh, constant need, one to bring the victim's rescue and victim's medical treatment being ready to provide for them. And then as you see, the search cam being operated by a tech search team member, specialist, and then the image of the Flow 360 camera. And what we're able to do is we're able to do a visualization direct with camera. We're able to do a palpation. We can ask that victim if they can go ahead and do a self-evaluation of themselves, i.e. when a soldier, an airman, a sailor, uh, an IED explodes next to them, they quickly do their own self-evaluation. They go for each extremity and they check their um, important intact uh, groin area and they realize that not only are they alive but they also have their extremities. Patients can do these self-assessments. That's why it's so important for a medic to be behind a search camera so that he can work visually and verbally with these patients as they're inside these areas. Secondary things that we're able to do, we're able to do so many things. I've had the privilege of working with the 360 camera in that we can even see the detail of dust movement from a patient whose face is on the ground in a dusty area on the floor as he's breathing and speaking the dust moving in the camera um, and so even without verbal contact able to see that that patient was alive just through the dust that was moving from those areas um, the cameras allowed us so many other things we're able to do and provide medical treatment down those holes. I'm able to provide glucose in one of those pods and hand it down there. I'm able to provide a pulse oximeter so now I can get blood pulses, I can get respiratory rates, I can get saturation rates. I could possibly prevent a breathing treatment with some beta-2 agonists so we can help drive some of that potassium back into the cell from any injuries that they may have, which would also help the patient with coughing. So there's many other things that we're able to do. And I just wanted to bring some of those ideas back to you and allow you an idea, an opportunity to. Uh, you're you're, you're up and live. People you are showing your face. Okay. You so I'm hoping we are able to take you through some experience. I'm hoping there's some questions out there or any other questions that you may have. Uh, well done, Joe. Um, why don't you show that uh, bottle that you were talking about? 
um, you can see me. What we did is, uh, this is a standard water bottle. Um, what we yep. do in the USAR field, we put a water bottle together, we put some items in there, we take some tape, we put it down the tape and we try and send it down the hole. Two issues that we were talking about, and the search, the teams as they buy their bores, their their core drill bores, to be able to drill these holes for the concrete. Yeah. They're not thinking medically. They're not thinking what can we get down the patient. They have one thing on their mind, what's the size of the camera head? And so these drill holes are not this size anymore. This is a three inch core, this is a big size. This fits a water bottle, but we rarely are seeing these size holes anymore just because of the advancement of technology. Things are getting smaller and a lot more elite. And so this might see its day go by. And so we tried to find a, a new wrench and we found uh, some plastic tubing. It's two inches in diameter. So it's the size of the Plus 360 camera. Um, we can make them any length. We believe that 12 inches is pretty good. Uh, we've been able to provide a closure with a loop. So as the camera is nice. brought down on a te tethered line, so can the pod. Lit up pod and can be dropped with a light in there. And then they can able to see this. The good thing about this is the water bottle. We watched the gentleman have a extreme hard time opening the bottle with his left hand. Obviously, he was right handed as well. But being entrapped, trying to get the tape off, trying to pop this bottle. And, mo and the good thing about these is they're, they're, they're one-handed. As soon as you squeeze the bottle, the, the top pops off. And so we're able to do this for a one-handed person and able to provide some stability with them. And we always Excellent. feel it's important to add a few things inside there, some marking tape, some crayons, I things that that person would be able to do. Shoot, we've even put... Uh, a small mirror in there for that person oh, nice. to be able to self-assess. We've nice. seen a victim take that yeah. mirror and put it down by their leg and say, I felt wetness down there, and but it's not me bleeding. It's it's just from a dripping pipe uh, to give you some ideas of what's going on. So it just changes some of the dynamics in there. But, you know, through that small hole, there's so much that can be done, Alan. I mean, we've been able to have the ability to take 50-foot sections of tubing and syringes and being able to hydrate. Uh, being able to uh, use Infamil, um, a, a feeding tube, uh, per se, for those victims that are down there. There's just so many other treatment modalities, i.e. glucose. Um, yeah. not, that you, not, that you're a glu not that you're a diabetic and in need of it, but if you've been down there for a day or two, you've been losing about a liter of fluid about every day. And so you know that you're not in the best state. And also pulse oximeters. Um, anything can be dropped down there in the smaller yeah. pods. Um, that would fit inside those holes. So we're real grateful for that. We're thankful. We're really excited that Agility added the Kesson uh, surveyor's tape. I think that tape needs to be renamed as a survivor tape. Um, <laughs> we've always mentioned that. Uh, it, has, it has the measurement of entry. And so as we've always done confined space training and you've put a tagline on an individual and they've gone inside the hole, we've always wanted to know how far are they in Yes. As a medical provider, why? God forbid we have a secondary collapse and we lose the entrance. I know my provider is in 25 feet and I was able to talk to my provider because he had the camera with him and the provider said that he went down a level. So he's one floor possibly down and 25 feet in. Now the rescuers can start looking for him in that area. So that tape is a world of difference. Actually, Matt, if you don't mind switching over, what I can do is I can show a couple of these accessories that um, that uh, Joe's been talking about. Will do. Yep, you're live. All right, so um, Joe, awesome. So while he was talking, one thing I wanted before I move on is that uh, I got to mute my microphone on my camera. Here we go. Is that um, the boring hole? So if you have equipment for this camera to fit, you need to bore a hole, take the bore itself, measure it across, and make sure it's two inches. So what happens then, if you have the right drill bit that does a two-inch bore, so when you measure the bore itself that comes out, the piece of concrete, it's got to be two inches across. That means the hole is literally two, two and a quarter, maybe slightly larger with the actual diameter of the drill bit itself. So that's an important key for all of you. And that's what allow also the tools that solid responders have been building to fit through that same hole. What we've also done with the MRK is we've added a couple of accessories that allow us 
to add tools to the front of the camera to assist Joe and his team of medics to maybe get some of those devices right into their hands. So we can actually change the front of the camera. And these are included in the MRK. You can attach the water bottle, lower it down to the hole, and then now maybe using the pole or vertically dropping, you can now um, gear it towards their hand. Interestingly enough, on a 360, we can't see the very tip of this, but what we can do is we can um, shoot for their hand that's open and then basically drop that water bottle, that package, that uh, wipes, whatever it is, directly into their hand. So there's this one we include as kind of an open hook. You might be able to drag things out of the way using the camera, right? And then we have a closed hook that you can put a carabiner on and then also do basically the same thing. The line he was talking about is this ability to, with the adaption of our O-ring, which comes with every one of our kits, is we can attach this line and it's actually measured, right? So uh, as you go in, as you do a vertical drop or you lower in or somebody crawls in with the camera, you can have an instant measurement of um, how far they've actually penetrated the space. So um, thanks, Joe, for bringing some of those extra accessories up. In fact, even in the MRK, we include a little tripod. So you could essentially lower the camera down and then have it sit on a tripod in a vertical position, change the setting to auto rotate, and uh, you can now monitor that, um, that victim for a long period of time and provide both sound and speech. So you can have a two-way conversation easing their fears. So this is a standard camera jack on here our camera thread and that's the same what's on the back of our camera so you can go to any um, basically camera shop and accessorize your fl 360 with any kind of tripod any kind of camera devices that are available to you know professional cameras so it's pretty pretty slick Alex, um, if i can say something that reminds me on that tripod uh i'm sure that uh it would have been used several times many times in 2001 and many times also in 2010. So a 10 year vast difference. And here we are in 20. And so when we were at the World Trade Center, uh, same thing with the Pentagon, because of the weight above, uh, the pile began to shift and it shifted every day. Every yeah. area of the rubble within the World Trade Center shifted. This pile might have shifted nine inches. The other pile next to it might have shifted a foot and a half. And so while we were underground, uh, it affected the rescuers. It affected them psychologically and yeah. what we were finding. And so they were even writing their names on their limbs in case there was a secondary collapse and they were trapped. The Army Corps of Engineers put up transits um, along all the buildings to register those settling and those diameters, the inches that those buildings were coming down or, or settling into the ground. That 360 camera set up with that tripod in certain areas would have visually captured of those measurements not from a linear type of seeing the difference but a, an actual visual also the earthquake in haiti i mean there were over 70 after aftershocks that inside the building uh, with these gentlemen as they were shoring up the inside of the caribbean market would allow them from another source because of the technology of it being seen by an outside source as those rescuers are inside the building working, putting up shores, a lot of paratech shores through different floors, an engineer, a structural engineer, could have been on the outside watching everything and being yes. able to assess everything for a safety officer. That is unbelievable. And so for that reason, during an event, just in itself, being able to see the changes, even the, um, the water, uh, rising again in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, uh, the levees being breached again. If those cameras were put at certain locations, they would have seen the breach. We wouldn't have had to been in such a hurry to get out of there because we knew that our base of operations was going to be underwater soon. So oh, it's, it's fantastic. And you can record it all too. So then later on your debrief, you can say, hey, you did this right. You did this wrong. We Let's improve on this. The, we are missing a piece of gear that we need. Um, yeah, it's quite remarkable. I mean, basically cameras are information gatherers to allow you to um, base decisions on those. So, I mean, that's what's important. I think that's how we approach it is this camera is used 
to gather information to make important decisions in the well-being of not only the team but of the individual that they're rescuing and in fact i have a a little clip here that i'm going to show about a victim being assisted i don't have the entire video but it was provided to us by indianapolis fire department um, who is a, a very very progressive fire department they record a lot of their rescues and then publish them for their community to see what they're doing it helps with their fundraising it helps with the building the um, credibility of the department within their community and they're a uh, great bunch of guys so they allowed us to actually use a little clip here and what this clip is is them rescuing a dog so this poor dog chased a gopher down a burrow and then got itself trapped <laughs> so here they are using the fl360 it's a two it's a wireless system so they don't have to have the video display attached to the pole which allows them extreme flexibility you can see the poor dog here trapped uh, they did dig him out but when you were talking about earlier about where this camera is located with the team, this is important. In Indianapolis Fire Department invested both in cameras for their USAR team, for their FEMA team, and then they invested in a camera for their rescue truck. And this is the camera that came off the rescue truck. It's not sitting in a warehouse somewhere locked up waiting for a big deployment. This was on the rig. They could just grab it and they could deploy it to save this little dog. I mean, I think that's... Um, I think that's huge and uh and that's sort of the message that we're trying to get along so we have made the three different kits the mrk being you know cost effective small it can cram into a little space on a battalion chief's truck or onto a rescue rig it takes up so little space and uh it's fast and easy to deploy and we even have the little eight inch tablet which will fit i don't know if, you know in the in your bdus in the pocket on the side of your bdu is actually slides into that pocket so we're pretty excited about where we're going with this. And we think that as we get the word out, people will be able to send us other cool videos on how they use this camera in different rescue scenarios. I think it's awesome. And hey Alan, guys, you, just, oh, go, oh, go ahead, Joe. Go Alan, ahead. you did mention the, uh, the wireless transmission. And I know that at a certain point in time, they are looking at going hardwire uh, with the camera also to avoid any issues uh, and some selections that some people have. Is that correct? It is right now it's it's uh, geared towards the 10 inch tablet which is in our USAR one kit we can go now up to 100 feet or 30 meters uh, hardwired and um, you know that's that's critical because the wireless depth of the camera to the um, to the tablet is about 60 70 feet depending on the environment you're in and that's because we protect the antennas inside the housing of the camera so it does limit us review by protecting those but this is a rugged application and we yes. have to protect the antennas and on that we we've been able to overcome that distance by using disposable repeaters ah inside the rubble pile because we have so much trouble getting signal even around the wall it presented an issue and so we kind of did a tactical event having the person and the camera around the corner from each other just because of using a, a tactical uh, environment and we had trouble so we had some disposable repeaters that we were using for another product and it picked it, it worked perfect oh. and they're, they're inexpensive so you leave them behind in the rubble pile yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic joe that's something that you know funny enough we haven't tried that we haven't tried disposal we'll have to send me the link yes, so, I so i can test it out for myself <laughs> i think that's a wonderful piece of information and, uh, and i'm sure that, that our... up, uh, was was a physician the person in the uh the brochure and the orange shirt is a pediatric intensivist but she's also a retired Army, uh, navy commander and so one of the situations and tactical that she was looking at was the boarding of an area of an unsecured location and so she wanted to be separate and uh we thought of the repeater she came out with it and she was overjoyed she also used that camera for a disentanglement of a printing press to visualize the other side of that victim's arm. So uh, a physician is using this camera. Uh, if you put the, the old moving head, rotational head camera in a medical person who had no idea of this camera and yes. you disoriented them, they'd never find the victim again. Absolutely would never, but the use of ease with this um, was phenomenal. And i.e. not to say the physicians 
um, aren't able to handle more technology, but <laughs> the lack of experience, it was incredible to see her be able to use the device. I've got a, I've got one question for you, Joe. Um, yes, sir. And it comes up, uh, I'm going to put you live here too. So yeah, put Joe live. Uh, yeah. Um, and this is just going to be one question because we have actually a bunch of questions that uh, um, the attendees have asked here. So we'll go to those in a second. Um, one of them is, there's a question of uh, using a thermal camera in search. Um, that would be heat signatures, looking for heat signatures versus color versus uh, infrared or night vision. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've, I've seen and heard through my uh, experience is that um, it's thermal can give off if you're using a thermal camera it can give you some false positives in the sense that if you're talking about liquid um, it could be blood from a human it could be any type of uh, a liquid from a human um, or it could be liquid from uh, uh, something within the building itself that was hot and that could be you know mistaken for blood if you will um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is thermal, uh, I would think that that would be a, a kind of a secondary tool, not a, a primary tool when it comes to cameras, because you want true color when you're doing search, correct? Correct. I would say that if they wanted to pull that out of their truck and use it as a primary to say there's a victim, maybe a victim, we've got some type of heat source, it might be a victim, we're really not sure. The only way to really confirm is to visualize. I'm not visualizing an image from a heat source being put off. And is that really a person and or something else? I can literally visually see a person with a search cam. I can see the facial impressions. I can tell you if there's two thumbs down there, two right thumbs, which means I got two victims. A thermal Im imager will never let me know that. But I know that with person, unless they're born very strange with two right thumbs, I've got two victims and not one. And so the other person is there, maybe, un, maybe covered or not. But yes, the thermal imager is a, is a valuable tool. Um, I've heard of people using gas monitors to be able to detect the presence of CO2 being breathed by a victim to confirm that there's a victim down there. I've even seen them bring down a, a life pack, a monitor, not to use any brand names, but a 12-lead but a, a, a monitor with those devices on there. And so I'm bringing down other devices that are the same cost, if not more, pretty much the same as bringing a 360 camera that has multi-uses. And I'm trying to solve a problem without going to the actual answer. And that's getting a small camera that I can use to not only detect any type of victims, but I can medically treat that victim and see them to the point that, I mean, I can, I can look at your hand and I can see that if you have clubbed fingers, I could tell you that you're probably a smoker. So you've got respiratory issues already before the dust impact happened. I can't see that with a thermal imager, but I can surely see that with a search cam. Good, Excellent. good, good, good. Um, okay, so let's go to our questions here, guys. Uh, we have a few of them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I'm going to switch it over to Alan. Um, please chime in, Joe, when uh, if you have something um, to say. And Alan's live. So the Hello. first question um, is, uh, is it possible to pair the camera with more than one tablet at the same time? Uh, it, uh, it certainly will be. So we're working diligently on just that capability. We understand that uh, um, definitely we want to be able to communicate with multiple devices and we want to communicate with those repeaters that Joe was talking about, uh, off the shelf repeaters to extend the transmission all the way back to command center. So while I say that, uh, we haven't deployed that yet. It hasn't been released as a software package. We're working diligently on it. Um, COVID-19 has uh, delayed some of those activities as uh, people get locked down. Uh, so we will um, in the future, and it'll be a free download to all of our current users that they'll be able to communicate with other Samsung devices that are current. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to basically go back to the end of time, the very first Samsung Android or whatever that was released, or for, at first Apple that was released. But if you got a current iPhone current iPad, current Samsung tablet, current Android tablet, whether it be HTC or any of those, will be able to communicate with those. So that'll open up quite a bit. There'll be a 
a command center, which will be the initial tablet that it establishes to the camera. So it'll control things like the, um, the lighting and the auto rotate and all of those. But the signal will be sent out to multiple devices and they'll be able to hit their own recordability. They'll be able to spin their own camera around and um, you know basically look. So it's just a signal that's sent out. So it's just it's a 2.4 gigahertz wireless. So it's just like your router at home, right? So we want to open that up. Right now, it is camera to one tablet that we choose. Uh, hardwire, um, that'll be a little different. So I think that if you're going to use it hardwire, you'd probably want to use it with the camera that we supplied with the kit. Um, I just expand on that. Um remember everyone uh, that that are on that are viewing right now the camera is mobile integrated right we're using an app to power the search capability of the camera so it's not no longer this articulated um proprietary visual display unit that you're just looking on a screen you're actually the, and what's great about that is because it's mobile integrated we can basically push new features into the camera through the application and or the firmware which can be done all through uh, the app itself. So um, as Alan said, there will be some changes here in the near future. All right, let's get to our second question here. Uh, how far can the camera be from the monitor and still send a signal? Um, Alan, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so um, we've done a lot of different testing. Uh, I've just been playing around showing you that this is truly running on an Android, uh, things of that nature. So let me just get back to here. I'm going to go here. Um, so, for instance, outside in the parking lot, I hooked up a camera. I set it onto the roof of my truck on a tripod, and I kept walking down the back alley until I lost signal. On the Tab A, which is one of the tablets that we had, I lost it about 70 feet. On the uh, Active Pros, I managed to get a little further. And then when the, the Tab A uh, lost connection, I had to walk back to the camera to gain connection. On the pros, I had to, as I walked back, it regained connection on its own. So it's it's kind of hard because the camera is not independent uh, or is independent of the tablet. So it's the combination that you have will actually determine the distance that you'll get in a straight line of sight. Now, think of a, a silo or your, your burn tower, right? And there's no structures around it. It's in the middle of a field. So if you're on one side, of the burn tower and you walk around the corner around to the other side, you're gonna lose contact because there's no way for the white waves, the wireless waves to bounce off any other structures to find you. And that's how it works. They're just waves of information, right? So as long as you're in a structure that the waves can get through like your home and go through the from the basement up the stairs, it waves through your kitchen, it goes out, finally it reaches you in your bedroom and you go on, geez, that sucks. As soon as I go in the living room, I have a stronger signal. That's because the waves are having a tough time getting to you. That can happen in an open environment. Now, that same burn building, if there was another structure right here, chances are we would have a signal on the other side of that burn building because they would literally bounce off this building and find that connection point. So. Hence, you know, the reason we do include the uh, cables in the big kit, the, the USAR kit, is the ability to um, hardwire in uh, really tough scenarios. In fact, just a, um, uh, we have to hardwire when we're at trade shows because there's a gazillion pieces of wireless equipment running rampant in that space and it actually interferes with our signal. On a rubble pile or something like that, or in the middle of a freeway and you're dealing with a overturned truck, a semi that's crashed and you're trying to find out if there's any pets in the sleeper or the wife is in the sleeper, right? You're not gonna run into that. There's not gonna be this confluence of wireless that's gonna interfere with you. Um, but if you're in a dam, which we've always had problems with wirelessly, you know, 12 thick foot walls and stuff like that is not conducive to wireless. We just had it uh, tried on a battleship and uh, the hardwire made all the difference. So we understand wireless is a great feature, but it's not the end all be all. There are going to be times when you need to wire up. The nice thing is though, we're not wired up onto a pole that's fixed. We got the camera. You can just attach a wire to it and you can walk in with just the camera and then you can set the camera down and off you go. So we have sort of the best of both worlds with the USAR-1. Eventually, we're trying uh, to get the little tablets, the smaller ones, the eight-inch tablets to do hardwire. 
um, but it just takes a little lot of effort. They're designed a little bit differently from Samsung, so they don't behave the same way. Um, but um, we're conscious of that, and we'll just keep exploring that possibility. Um, I sent you, Joe, uh, an actual question in Spanish on iMessage, if you want to take a look at that. I'm wondering if you could answer um, that question. Oh, can you go live to Joe? Yes, I can. Just give me a second. This is our first time, kids. So. <laughs> Joe, Hopefully did you get Microsoft, it? Hopefully yes. Microsoft Teams will update their software where we can have two people on at the same time. Yeah. There you go. The, the question uh, is in Spanish, and that what they're asking me, is there a system that is able to be used on the 360 camera to be able to lower the camera into a well? And so the answer is yes. Um, the tether system that you've allowed uh, to lower that camera on the eye hook uh, takes away the, the wand or the handle that we're restricted to, either solid and or expanding. We're not restricted. I believe that the tape that uh, Agility provides that Alan has behind him is 50 foot long. Yeah. Now, may we run into some issues with the transmission of the camera being so far away from the tablet? That's a possibility. But we were talking about disposable repeaters, and that may be able to solve that answer. If I may, can I answer that question in Spanish? Please do. Absolutely. Yes, if you would. Okay. La pregunta fue si hay un sistema disponible para la cámara del sistema de 360 para poder bajar la cámara en un pozo. Sí, se puede. Al lado del señor Allen hay un cable sistema hecho de fiberglass. Tiene una resistencia de 200 libras. Pueden apoyar la cámara al final del rollo de sistema. Es como una, una cinta con medidas. And so, usted sabe ya enseguida la distancia de la cámara a usted. Si es 5 pies, 20 pies, 30 pies. Porque la cinta tiene medidas de poder bajar la cámara. Hay una pequeña eh, problema que puede existir en la distancia que él estaba hablando antemente de poder transmitir sin cable la información de la, de la cámara a la tableta. Y alguno él estaba diciendo que pueden ser unos 20 pies, 30 pies. Y al mismo tiempo estamos hablando de eh, disponible eh, en inglés repeaters que pueden seguir la transmisión de la cámara a este sistema, entonces a la tableta. So poder la Pregunta, si se puede. Thank you, Joe. You got it. And before I forget, I know uh, the first question you had mentioned was lighting and, and using the, the use of thermal imaging camera and things like that. And I know that the we answered most of that, but you had mentioned as far as lighting. And I know that we, we put in a red light inside those survivor pods to pass down because a bright light in a, in a dark room that no one has seen light for a while is very blinding. So a red light is a lot uh, calmer, a lot easier to see. We know that a white light can be seen a mile away. You shine a white light, that's a mile vision. And so for a tactical event, can the Flow 360 be used in tactical environments? And the answer, Alan, is yes, correct? Yes, because that's of the correct. technology We're working on that right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Could you let the uh, military folks, and not just them, but also the rescue teams, i.e., uh, we've dealt with some questions from the folks from Abu Dhabi, and their rescue teams, because they come out of the military complex, they have a survey dual role. And so some of their lighting is not bright light, but infrared. Yeah, so we're actually working diligently on that. We see that as a, a market opportunity, and we also see it as a, a useful tool in, in rescue community as well. Uh, so it will not be thermal. It'll be infrared night vision. So. What we had to do though is we had to build a new camera to do that because um, there's not enough power in the existing one to to keep the lights from glowing red, right? So we need the lights to be in a spectrum where they provide the IR, 
but they don't display red. So when you enter a room, people don't see the red glowing lights. So it will be a next um, version of the camera and it'll be independent of what we have now because the two shall not meet. You cannot switch between color and infrared in one single camera. So it'll be a whole new purchase. However, if you can imagine just getting one or uh, two of the lenses, you know, into a space and all you need to do is get this much of the camera inside and now you have 360 view instantly, right? I mean, uh, if you can imagine, you know, searching a space so quickly up and down, so you can looking for a threat and stuff like that so quickly with this camera, we think it has legs. Now in, in a rescue scenario, like you say, it might be a little less obtrusive, like it's not as blinding light that's coming at them. It, uh, it provides a different kind of image, which is quite unique. And um, ideally, think it, uh, it might be a little expensive for that. But if you have one already, use it in training. Uh, Hang yeah. it. Hang yeah. it in training. It, you it can watch your, your, yeah. your uh, students uh, fight with a confined space with their supplied airlines, with their mask, with their you know, calm lines. And they're trying to get through a hole. And they do this. They take their mask off because they're not used to wearing one in a confined space. You need to know that as an instructor. Yes. And That's you right. can spy on them with a night vision FL 360. <laughs> that camera would, just mean, right? <laughs> it would have been definitely used in Haiti as well because while the USAR teams went to the public area of the Caribbean market, the State Department was working in another area, undisclosed, on certain um, information. And yes. so being in along with them, that camera with the infrared would have been used all day long uh, to make confirmations. And so it, it, it's there and it does have legs. <laughs> yeah, we're really excited about it. This will be a 2021. Like we have to because yep. I think it's such an important part and it's something that we can bring to those people to uh, help protect lives, those that they're trying to deal with, right? Because the more information you have, the better you can use non-lethal weapons and then protect the team itself. That's the most important part. Everybody's got to come home. Right. So if we can help by providing more data, and that's really what it is, data to make decisions, visual data, the microphone is super sensitive. Uh, in fact, we're going to put at some point a visual representation of what you hear on the on the screen itself. So even though you're like, I'm 55, my hearing is crap, too much Led Zeppelin, whatever, you know, I... Uh, my, my camera will pick up sounds that I will never hear. So it'll visually display it. And all of these things we're talking about, these little features, they will come out free to our users, all their existing users and users that are coming up. But the IR will be a separate entire camera that will be built um, next year. Um, thanks, Alan. I got another question from John. Hey, John, I hope you're well. Uh, this is John Gilkey. Um, can the camera pair with VR goggles and a handheld mouse for use in high sunlight conditions? I can answer that. Um, yes, the camera can pair with VR goggles at, pre at the present time. Um, and you can use an actual Bluetooth virtual joystick to move around. Or, of course, if you move your head around, um, you can obviously see the space. The only... Um, problem is that it can only be done with a recorded video uh, that again is going to change um, in the near future I can understand in the high sunlight conditions how, how hard it can be um, to see a space uh, from the outside um, so yeah VR goggles would work obviously you don't want to walk around with VR goggles on because uh, you'll most likely trip and fall but um, <laughs> uh, yes with the recorded um, uh, video uh, through the camera you can actually view through VR goggles. I, I've tried this extensively. Uh, it is somewhat, um, if you've never used VR before, uh, it's, it, 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 it can be hard on the brain. Uh, and uh, I felt sick within a good two minutes of, of looking around in the space, especially if the camera's moving. If the camera's not moving, it's okay. But if the camera is moving in the space, it's a little bit different. So uh, only recorded video at this time. Um, Can I expand on that, Matt? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, the, the, what I want to expand on is that when you're 
the wireless gives you the opportunity to use this as a two person system, right? So one person is responsible for the poll and placing the camera into what they think is good void spaces to search, right? Based on the dog, whatever, making noises or alerting. So the individual who has the tablet can literally take their jacket and put it over themselves creating their own shade yeah. environment yeah. and blocking out the sun. They don't have to move. They can be absolutely stationary. And then the person with the probe can be moving around, also watching where they're stepping. So this is really a two person operation search is much, much safer than a single person staring at a yeah. display, wandering around a rubble pile. And I, I really want to preach that because I've seen it. I've been around a long time. I used to sell search cam. And I used to see people trouncing around with the 3000 and tripping and sliding all over the place. So two, if you see this image here, two people operation, but the, the sun, the shade, the rain, the snow, protect the guy operating the tablet with a poncho, a, uh, a tarp, a jacket, a whatever it needs to be, block out the sun, block out the rain, block out yeah. the, and that's the way I would yeah. treat that until we had VR glasses more though, like Matt said, I would, be absolutely nauseous using VR glasses. <laughs> I, I've even seen them during a training event and it worked. The instructor who was also a battalion chief in his department, get inside his vehicle and watch the camera while the yeah. individual holding the camera was getting soaking wet outside. <laughs> and he got the perfect transmission. So yes, a bunker coat, a salvage blanket, anything will cut the sunlight out of there as well. Yeah, it's a it's a great trick. It's inexpensive. Doesn't cost you anything. Um, and going back to the recording, so I don't know if anybody's ever done it, but uh, you get out there, you draw the short straw. The guy with the short straw gets the camera <laughs> and the pole, and he goes out into the rain, the pissing rain, the the snow, and he inserts it into a bunch of places, the guy with the tablets under cover, and he's recording. Yeah. And then you come back under cover and you review each space to see if you need to go back. Right? In, I mean, Haiti, it's, in Haiti, they were in sewage, uh, about knee deep sewage from broken pipes. Yes. So they did pick the lower uh, gentleman to go in with the camera and the engineer stayed a little bit further back on high ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you need the new guy uh, on the team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, I, we've got another question here, and I th awesome. we we discussed it a little bit um, in our presentation uh, regarding ATEX and intrinsic safe approvals. Um, the camera is not ATEX approved, nor is it intrinsic safe approved. Uh, no. That would mean that this is not a uh, an explosion proof uh, camera uh, or communication device. So. If you're going to use this in any confined space, uh, please make sure that it's well ventilated um, before using the camera. Uh, we, we can't stress that enough. Again, it is not ATEX or intrinsic safe approved. Absolutely so. not. And nor could it be. There's no way it would pass the uh, dust test. Um, the, the, the extremes that they put equipment through to meet IS approvals, as they should, right? Because it's meant to be in a hazardous environment. Yeah. Matt and I come from a world where that's what we did for years to sell extremely high intrinsic safe approved products. We know everything about that. And we know that this camera can't meet that in its current form factor. And we don't know if there's a big enough market to ever build it to yeah. do that. We're going to play a little financial bit just, thing. just for dust um, purposes. And, and Matt, you want to switch and, over? Yeah. And back of the, that, that pod, that two inch uh, tube fits the camera inside very tightly. And so I'm still able to get the visualization in there, maybe keep that dust out of there with that mic. I'm going to see how well the voice is with this without changing to the environmental cover and lowering the camera down in this protective pod. Not sure oh. if it's going to work, but we're going to give it a shot and uh, see how far the 360 will take us. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. So if we could come up with some type of sleeve that would IS approve the camera inside the sleeve and still have visuals. That's the problem is having a nice clear vision, not going through another medium. That's how they do iPhones. If you want your iPhone intrinsic and safe approved, you put it into a case and it's IS approved. A little different if, for ours, but it's possible. The case, yeah, if of course the case is IS approved yeah. for the actual. Yeah. So it would have to be purpose built. Um, 
There is some Spanish speak, uh, speaking people on here, um, Joe. So I'm wondering if you could uh, just expand upon that ATEX intrinsic safe uh, in Spanish, if you could, please. Sure. Uh, la pregunta. Sorry, Matt. La, yeah, pregun sorry, la pregunta anterior fue el poder usar la cámara en un sistema que hay la posibil posibilidad de explosión, de electrificación de algo en la cámara que puede asistir unos gases que están instables en el área. Y en esa pregunta no se puede. La cámara 360, en la forma que está diseñado, eh, tiene la potencia de tener la reconocción de voz, de, vo de, de, de la voz suya, de la voz del víctima. Y por eso razones, sí hay otra cubierta que puede estar en la cámara que preventa la comunicación de voz y nada más deja la comunicación de vista. Pero todavía en la forma que la cámara está diseñada no tiene instrumente las oportunidades de otra cámara de entrar en las minas donde los gases son no están estables. Eh, son los gases que no están estables. Tiene que usar una cámara aprobado, igualito que un teléfono, igualito que las luces, la electricidad. No se pueden estar disponibles a la potencia de una explosión en sola cámara. En este momento no está diseñada para las minas por esa razón de por la potencia de una explosión. Pero en las otras, sí. En todas las otras se puede. Ok. So that was a, 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 a an enduring, as you think in English, I'm now having to translate my, my Spanish instead of putting my Spanish hat on and, tra and think and translating in English. So it just takes me a little while to, to get moving, but uh, oh, we all appreciate good. it. All good. I've got one. I've got one more question before we wrap this up and, sure. um, and I'll send Alan over to, uh, to answer it. So what is the IP rating on the camera, Alan? Uh, so the IP rating on the camera is IP68, and what that actually means is with the environmental lid, not the speaker mic lid, the environmental lid, which has no holes in it, you're allowed to put the camera in water, not diesel, gasoline, acid, you know, anything, but water uh, for uh, 10 feet, 3 meters, up to 30 minutes. Okay, so that's the limitation. So I always recommend that, and it's um, really only for the USAR kit because you have to be hardwired. A uh, wireless does not work underwater, right? So we have the 10 foot cord that comes, so you run it through the tube, comes out the back, you go into the camera. So as long as you're using the probe in the, the camera into the water and we're using the probe, you won't exceed the 10 feet. Right. So it's a good it's a good safety measure. If you're in a in a boat and you're going from house to house in a flooded situation, make sure you secure the camera with a shoulder strap or at least tie it off to the boat so you don't lose it over the side. If you're actually carrying it, holding it over the side of a boat and you drop it in, you want to get that out. The tablets, either with the tab A with the OtterBox or with the Pro that has it built in, is also IP68. So the camera tablets and the camera uh, are IP68. Do not exceed that and do not, do not give it to your dive team. They will wreck your camera and it will cost you big to get it fixed and replaced. <laughs> I will, I'd like to expand on that in that um, the, the IP68 rating is, it's not for the purposes of, of using First Look 360 as an underwater camera. That's not no. why it was designed. I want to be very clear here. Um, the IP68 rating is for use where you're lowering the camera into a space and the camera in, in heavy wet conditions and the camera accidentally goes in water. Or if you know that there's water below and you, you, you think you see something in the water and you want to bring the camera in underwater to see it, um, then, then use the camera then. Uh, it, this is not an underwater camera. No, if this you is want, not an underwater camera. And then, we never intended it to be, and we will not intend it to be. Underwater is precarious to begin with. It's got to be designed entirely different. Usually a good underwater camera 
will not good work well outside of water. That's, I mean, that's the kind of things that you have to think about. So the camera is useless out of water, but it's great underwater. So you, there's this kind of trade-off that you have to do. You either buy an underwater camera for your dive team and use it in a certain scenario, or you buy a, a camera for multi-purpose outside of water. The only uh, application that I could really see it working would be uh, maybe swift water. But for most user cases, and Joe can attest to this, the water that is around uh, use our environment or a uh, building collapse, there is no visibility within, yeah. you know, a centimeter or an inch of, of a no. camera. Like <laughs> it's like so. a soup of nasty. Like soup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so having said that, though, if you put your camera in a soup of nastiness, which like a, like a Katrina or whatever, uh, New Orleans there, it was it was vile, uh, is that um, the camera can be um, uh, cleaned and deconned using a bleach solution. Uh, typically, Joe, I think it's what, uh, 8 to 1 or 10 to 1? Yes. 1% bleach, 10% or 10 times water. So if, if they're diluted, so we went back to every manufacturer of o-ring of light of button of uh, seal of everything that to do with this camera and we made sure that it can be deconned if it comes in contact with um people's um blood or vomit or anything like that or you drop it into a, a nasty soup after a major usar event all right well i think that's it uh, a lot of people are not a lot of people but a couple of three people have uh, uh, I've asked questions about those disposable repeaters. We'll um, bring some information to folks offline on that. Uh, we certainly have all your emails to, uh, so we can send out some information on that. Uh, we have to discuss it internally because um, well, we this is the first we've heard from Joe. So um, thanks, Joe. We will. <laughs> This is an Talk agility. Somebody, uh, this is an agility technology invention. <laughs> we thought we'd there have to go. wait to our next program to be able to do that, but if we can do it yeah. now, that would be very helpful. And so yeah. we can put those links potentially on our YouTube channel, right, Matt? After we post yeah, this, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, or I can send out information yeah. to all the okay. uh, of the of the webinar. Uh, other than that, I'd really like to thank Joe for uh, our being Absolutely. our guest uh, presenter. Uh, and taking time out of your day uh, to talk about your experience and uh, how to use the camera in um, in urban search and rescue and from a medical perspective, which is very new. Um, is there any words you'd like to uh, close with, uh, Joe, at all? Um, I'd like to thank the opportunity. First, I'd Go like live, to thank, Matt. Uh, yeah, I will. Definitely would like to thank uh, all the listeners that came on. Uh, those of you that registered for this podcast, thank you for having the interest not in what I was really saying, but the interest in furthering your team's development, furthering your department's development, and being able to help the community. I want to thank Matt, and I want to thank Alan. And with all that said, with the advanced dual role, um, aggressive EMS systems that we have, victims and the ability to rescue victims should be our number one priority. And that's why the 360 was developed. And we should be able to do that, treat these victims and bring them back safe so that they stay alive. Thank you. Saludos. Thanks, Joe. Dios te bendiga. Gracias por disponerse <laughs> y poder dejar a nosotros explicarle un poco a ustedes de la sistema de 360 de la cámara. Gracias. Si tiene unas preguntas, por favor, sigue con Alan o con Matt en Agility. Ellos van a poder ayudarle con cualquier pregunta que tenga. Que tenga un buen fin de semana. Thanks, awesome. Joe. And closing thoughts, uh, Alan, at all? Uh, yeah, I just um, I really want to emphasize the point that um, if there if we didn't cover everything you wanted to know, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we do this uh, for a living. We love talking about the product. We're stuck in our office. We can't go <laughs> anywhere. So I've got this great video system. I can do a hands on demo specifically to you and your rescue team. And I'd be happy to do that. Any of our users, if you want to follow up training session i record it you can keep it and you can use it for any new hires that you have yeah. so we really let's use the technology that's available to us and uh by all means if you thought this was a great presentation please please pass it on to somebody who you think might benefit from knowing that the camera is available one of the things that keeps me up at night 
is somebody will buy a camera that was built 20 years ago, not realizing that the FL360 is out there and can really change the way that you do your rescue work. So that, that's something we just got to get the word out, get the word out there. So spread it, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, end by thanking everybody for attending. Um, this is our first webinar of many in the future here. And um, most of what uh, any news or any new features or anything related to use are, we, we post quite often on our agility social profiles. So uh, please follow us on those. Um, this particular webinar will be uploaded to YouTube and shared to you uh, via email. It will also be shared on our social profiles. So please share it. Um, it this webinar answers a lot of questions a lot of people have. So uh, it would be uh, it would be very good for um, your colleagues. Uh, on behalf of Agility Technologies, uh, on behalf of Joe and on behalf of Alan, I'd just like to thank everyone and uh, have yourselves a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it.